I, I want to talk with you today about something that um, that has been a, a, a game changer for me in my life with God and in my relationships with other people. And uh, and as I learned what I'm going to share with you today, uh, I've seen how leaning into this dynamic, it changes people. I oftentimes stay up late to work on stuff for several reasons, because my whole family is asleep. and it's quiet. <laughs> but sometimes late could mean one or two o'clock in the morning, sometimes three, and sometimes I'm hearing the birds begin to sing and the sun peeking through the window. That's why I know maybe I stayed up just a little too late. But sometimes my four-year-old daughter, her name is Sydney. She's the one in the middle. We have a seven-year-old, four-year-old, and a two-year-old. The seven-year-old sleeps through the night fine. The two-year-old, eh. <laughs> but the four-year-old not only wakes up, but she gets out of her bed, and she knows dad has a habit of working late. So she'll walk out. She didn't really want a whole lot. She'll just walk out and maybe want to lay down next to me. I'm like, no, you're not laying down here. We have to get you back in the bed. And sometimes it's, uh, it's irritating. Because <laughs> um, I'm, I'm up late because you're supposed to be asleep. I'm supposed to be able to work on interrupted but she wakes up and she comes out and this is the, I, I'm seeing a difference in two different approaches and this particular time I was talking to her and I said Sydney you you have to go back to sleep but I want to be with you I'll still be here in the morning you can go back to sleep Oh, but I want to be with you. I want a drink of water. <laughs> the thirstiest people on the planet are small children at bedtime. <laughs> I want a drink of water. No, you don't want a drink of water. Listen, you have to get your rest. You need to go back to sleep. And all this, so I'm trying, my point is, I'm trying to rationalize with her the benefits of leaving me, getting more sleep. But the benefits of her going back to, I'm rationalizing, all right? As she's making an argument for why she should still be awake, I'm countering the argument for why she should still be asleep. And I'm recognizing that I am 45 and she is four and she's winning. And I, <laughs> And, and so I'm like, this is, like, this is not working. But the more I try to rationalize them and the more I feel like I'm losing ground, the more upset I'm getting. I can feel myself getting more impatient. I can feel myself getting more irritated. I can feel myself beginning to lean into the area of being a father that I don't want to be. And then I said, God, this girl needs to go to sleep. <laughs> he said, do to her what I do to you. Now, I knew what that mean, meant because, like I said, I'm going to share with you some things in my own life in the past few years that I've just discovered. And it clicked. And I stopped trying to debate her. Debate a four-year-old at two o'clock in the morning. And I'm still losing, right? This is the weirdest thing. And I said, um, I said, come here. And I sat on my lap and I just held her for a little bit. And then she said, Daddy, can you tuck me in? And 
I said, of course I can. And on the inside, I was like, yes! <laughs> I picked her up, put her in bed, tucked her in, and she, she went back to sleep. I was trying to use logic, rationale, reasoning, when I needed to use comfort. For some reason, the comfort erased all of her other concerns. She woke up and she didn't need a rational argument. She woke up because she needed comfort. I want to talk to you today about the hidden power of God's comfort. Comfort. And if, if you learn this, it will change your whole life with God and your whole life, period. The hidden power of God's comfort. And I call it the hidden power because it's something that we don't see. Because we don't see it, we don't lean on it, we don't trust it, we don't seek it. And then we don't benefit from it. The hidden power of God's comfort. My daughter was, had some anxiety, maybe some fear, maybe all this whatever. I, and at the moment, our, what blocked my perception was thinking about how her behavior was affecting me. It wasn't about what she needed. It was about how it was affecting me. And any time your perspective is laced or colored with how someone else's behavior is just affecting you, you cannot help but be at a disadvantage in being able to respond appropriately. Our relationships would change, be more enriched if we learn how to perceive what people are needing by the behavior they're displaying. Even if we don't know, we can learn to ask. But not just about other people. Because you'll actually learn to do this with other people when you learn to do this with yourself. Even your own behavior. Analyzing your own behavior. Questioning your own behavior. Evaluating your own behavior. One of the things I want to encourage you to start thinking about after this message, one of the takeaways today, is when you look at your behavior patterns that are dysfunctional, your behavior patterns that are unhealthy, your behavior patterns that are sinful, ask yourself this question, what kind of comfort am I seeking by doing this. Seeking comfort is the motive behind addictions. That's how they get started. Seeking comfort is the motive behind a lot of behavior patterns that we see. And when we think of addiction, sometimes we think of like the, the more visible ones or the stronger ones, but sometimes like shopping is an addiction. Eating can be an addiction. Uh, I, I remember one time ministering to somebody who literally had an evil spirit come out because of her addiction to chocolate. Now, is chocolate bad in and of itself? Does it mean you're going to get a demon every time you... No. No, 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 that's a lie. That's a lie. But there is a Hershey spirit that could, that could attack you in moments of weakness. I'm just, I'm kidding. <laughs> it, it, it's not so much, a stronghold is not so much about the activity itself. It's about the hold it has on you and what you go to it for. Nothing wrong with eating food, but if you go to food for comfort, that's what's out of balance. If you go to uh, uh, the, the mall to go shopping, just seeking comfort, it, it can be out of balance. 
And so people are oftentimes involved in these behaviors that they, they're trying to quit for a long time and they can't. Or maybe you're trying to help someone, walking them through some stuff, and they can't seem to stop. They can't seem to stop. And it could be sleeping with people, looking for comfort, gambling, looking for comfort, drinking, looking for comfort, pornography, looking for comfort, all kinds of things. Controlling people, looking for comfort. I'm more comfortable if I'm in charge. I'm more comfortable if I'm in control and I can create predictable outcomes. Even if those outcomes are your behavior. If you do things out of my control, you're going to hear from me. Sometimes you grow in life and you mature and things like this and you begin to change. You begin to be more healthy, more independent. And the person who has control, who's that control, they say, I don't like the, the new you. I, don't, I know you don't. <laughs> the new me is the free me and you benefited from my bondage. So you either get used to the new me or you won't be seeing me. Freedom requires new boundaries. And this is why some people can have an encounter with God, have a moment with God, get free of, of some things, and it lasts for a little while, and then end up going back because they didn't create new boundaries with the new freedom. Because the freedom was so new, they didn't know what to do to keep it. They're still uh, used to the older environment. That's the use of the older uh, dynamics, the older relationship of manipulation and control and all this other kind of stuff. My point is, no matter what you've got going on, one of the things that's under the, 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 the surface behind those things that you've been working on for a long time, been trying to quit for a long time, been trying to hide for a long time. Because some things, if we, if we can't fix it, we just think, okay, well, we just can't. We can't let everybody know we got this going on. If, it's not, if, we, if we have no resolution to it and we, and, we, and we resolve that, well, this is just going to be a part of my life, then we also resolve to say, well, I just can't let other people know about it. Like the best I can do is just hide it. But, but in the gospel, we don't, we don't find that, that, that hiding stuff or keeping it secret is our best option. You can actually be free, you can be delivered, you can be transformed, you can be changed so that you're the same person publicly and privately. I mean, every one of us has some stuff that right now, I called you on stage and said, tell us what your secret sin is. Now, you're not going to be like, hmm, I don't know what you're talking about. No, you're, you're going to know. All of us do. All of us. Every single one of us. And if you keep that in mind, you'll be able to offer grace for other folks. All of us are in need of God's grace. All of us are in need of his forgiveness. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the grace. All of us. And even with our positions in Christ, who were covered by the blood of Jesus, who were forgiven, we, are, we, are, we, have, we have peace with God. We'll look at this text in a few minutes. We have peace with God. There's still some things we have not quite yet overcome in our lives. And what I'm submitting to you today is perhaps the unseen culprit behind whatever it is you're struggling with. Seeking comfort. Seeking is comfort seeking behavior. A lot of our sins is comfort seeking behavior. A lot of our arguments in relationships, whether you're married or single or whatever, it's, it's comfort seeking behavior. And we're not aware of it because we're not taught to be honest about our vulnerabilities. To seek Comfort intentionally and in a healthy way is to acknowledge that something is broken here. Something is missing here. I'm not able to do what I wanted to do. I'm, I'm feeling helpless. I'm feeling hopeless. I'm feeling hurt. I need 
comfort. When you can do that uh, consciously, then you're in a better place to have that need met in a healthy, functional way instead of an unhealthy, dysfunctional way. And so, what I've learned with my, with my kids is that sometimes, even when they're having arguments with each other or trying to argue with us, and I'm quick to, to defend my position uh, as, as the parent and my, my rationale, the reason why you can't have goldfish right now. <laughs> is because... You know, when they say, well, well, why? You know, the whole, because I said so, like, I thought I would never say that. And it's, it comes out more frequently than I just, I would ever imagine. But yet, there it is, right? <laughs> but sometimes, in the midst of these intense moments, I'm reminded, this is not about rationale. Come here. Come here. Even before coming here that today, the kids had a little argument. One had built this little fort. You know, my seven-year-old at least built this fort, spent a lot of time doing it. And then the two-year-old was like, ooh, fort. <laughs> <clears throat> Just, and so my seven-year-old, no, stop it, stop it. Oh, she's messing it up. <laughs> and so I could say, well, here's the deal and then explain the rules of the house. Everything you use to build this fort are components that are, belong to everybody. <laughs> Nothing you've used here is, is entirely yours completely. You have used shared items, and now you have declared that you have sole ownership of the fort. This is not your reality. And in fact, if we want to go deeper, this whole house and the cattle on a thousand hills belongs to your, your dad and your mom. You own nothing in this. You brought nothing in, and it's for sure you'll take nothing out. Like, it's, I didn't, I could have done that, but I... I've, I've learned that's not the best approach. <laughs> I've learned to recognize that as a child, when she's frustrated, she needs comfort. When she's angry, she needs comfort. When she's sad, she needs comfort. When she's discouraged, she needs comfort. When she feels that she's let her own self down and failed at something, she needs comfort. Are you catching the pattern? And I've discovered some things in my kids. I've been able to see it different because of my different relationship with God. And I see it so much more clearly. And because I've seen it so much more clearly, I'm able to offer that to her. Like this morning, come here, just bring it in. Bring it in. Her crying stops within seconds. Like it's magic. The crying stops within seconds. And then I'm able to say, this is my house. I'm, I'm just kidding. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't say that. <laughs> I was able to explain to her. I said, listen, you built, you built a fort in the playroom where you and all your sisters can play. You have to know that when this fort looks so amazing, your sisters are going to want to play in it. Instead of trying to make it forbidden, show them how to play in it. So if she's hitting this, yeah, like there's a drum thing over here. Say, so if she's hitting this, show her to hit the drum. What if she hits it too hard? Then you show her how to hit it lightly. Okay. All right. Good. I got to go to the Rock of Roseville and tell them about comfort. <laughs> I'm telling you, listen, it works. Not just for kids, but with people. And God knows it works with you. And that's why he said, Jesus said, when, I'm, when I leave, I'm going to send you. Oh, y'all read that too? 
the Comforter. Out of all the things the Holy Spirit is going to be sent here to do, it's to bring you comfort. He's called the Comforter. He's called the Advocate. He's called the Helper. When Jesus says, I'm going to be with you always, what's the point of him saying that? To bring comfort. To know that no matter what happens, that there's, I'm not removing all the bad things from life, but I'm telling you that when they do happen, you can come to me for comfort. Comfort. And I will be with you. When you understand uh, the purpose of prophetic words, uh, the Apostle Paul tells the Corinthian church, he says that prophecy is good for exhortation, encouragement, and comfort. Comfort. When you learn how to receive the comfort from God, it will change your life. Because some of the behaviors you have are because you're trying to get that from other people and they don't have the ability to give it to you. Like every human being... I mean, there's some, you know, if somebody gives you a hug, yeah, you're going to feel comforted, right? Someone gives you an encouragement, you're going, to, you're going to feel some aspect. But there are some things that happen in your life that are so deep that a personal hug is not going to help you. It can be part of the support. It can add some level of comfort, especially you're, you're grieving, right? Someone passes away, you got people who just, what do they do? Want to hug you, right? Maybe even feed you or things like that. They're trying to serve you, and it helps to a degree. But I'm telling you that every human being has the capacity for a depth of pain that can only be reached by God himself. And we're all going to experience the depth of pain, hurt, disappointment, betrayal, all that stuff. And, the, and we've got to know how to go to God. If we don't, if we don't, then to try to meet this need that nothing can meet, we will search the world through all kinds of dysfunctional ways. So, you know, this phrase has been said, looking for love in all the wrong places. Well, when people are looking for love in all the wrong places, what is it that love is supposed to provide? Comfort. So a big part of this is being able to recognize right now, in this moment, I'm feeling angry. Right now, in this moment, I'm feeling alone. Right now, in this moment, I'm feeling sad, depressed, isolated abandoned, hurt, betrayed, right now, being aware of that, now you can go, what am I going to do about that? In the past, when I haven't been able to recognize that, it played out through crazy stuff. But now that I've learned to just sit, I mean, what's going on with me? Right? When I say something I know I shouldn't have said, when I do something I know I, know I shouldn't have done, let me just learn to step back and go, wait, 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 what's, what's going on with me? Because something is, is driving the motor right now, running the engine right now, and I'm not aware of it. In what area am I needing comfort? Your self-awareness is the first step. Secondly, you need to be honest about your vulnerability. I, I, I'm weak here. I can't fix this right now. I'm hurt. I'm this. I'm that. Be aware of it. And then decide what you want to do about it. I'm going to look at this, this passage here. In John chapter 14. In John 14, Jesus, he had begun this whole chapter by talking about, listen guys, I'm getting ready to leave you. All right, I'm going to prepare a place for you. They've been with Jesus for three years and now he's talking about leaving. Like This is, this is going to be a problem. So he goes on to say, don't let your hearts be troubled. I know this is concerning to you, deeply concerning to you that I'm saying I'm going to leave. But don't let your hearts be troubled. In the context of this conversation, he says in verse 16, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper. That's the word there, helper, advocate, comforter, right? To be with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. 
I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. So he's saying, I'm, I'm going to go to another place, but I'm not going to leave you as, as, as orphans. Now, in this context, orphans doesn't mean without parents. Orphans, biblically, biblically, Old and New Testament, orphan means without father. Pure and undefiled religion is to take care of widows and orphans. Widows are still there. The father is missing. Because to be without the father is to be without comfort. It's to be without protection. It's to be without guidance. That's why he says you got to take care of them together, like both of them. To be, as a matter of fact, the King James Version puts it this way. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. So he sends the comfort. Why is that so important? Because of what I'm telling you. In every area of your life, you're going to need comfort. Some of you are chasing uh, more, and more, uh, more and more money. Now, we can all use money. We can all use more money. We can all use, right? But the way you're chasing it, your motive is because you are lacking comfort. There's a certain dollar figure that would make you feel more comfort. Maybe you're pursuing particular positions of power. This is a, you're not seeking just a potential for power. You're looking because you need comfort. If you have this particular level or status, you'd feel more comfort. So it, it's behind what we're chasing. What I'm telling you is that when we learn to find the comfort in God, the chase becomes different. Philippians 4 Verse 7, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Jesus Christ. The peace of God brings comfort. Peace and comfort go together. You get comfort from God. So let me say this as we as we um, as we go ahead and, and, and land land the plane here. This comfort I'm talking about that you receive from God is completely based on your relationship with Him. You got to know some things about Him. You got to know that you can actually go to Him. So there has to be a feeling in your heart that number one that He's safe. That number two that, that He's good. That you that you can actually go to Him. But if your your, your picture of God is that He is distant, you're not going to go to Him for comfort. If your picture of God is that you know when you make a mistake, He is judging you and He's going to bring down you know hellfire and brimstone and He's pointing the finger at you and wants to rub your nose and all your mistakes. If that's your picture of God, you're not going to go to Him for comfort because you see Him as a source of condemnation. And if you see God as a source of condemnation or a source of criticism you're not going to go to him for comfort. So for some of you, you got to really get into the gospel and it's got to change by the power of the Holy Spirit your view of who God is. Because if you have a, an unbiblical and unhealthy view of who God is and he is the, the ultimate source of comfort and you isolate the ultimate, true, right source of comfort, you can't help but try to find it in all, all these other means. And you're going to put undue pressure on people in your relationships, and they're going to try to help you, they're going to try to serve you, but they're not going to be able to go deep enough, and you're going to be frustrated with them thinking that they're not doing what they need to be doing better enough, I mean good enough, to help you. Like if they just did this better, then you would feel better. No, you have a depth of pain that only God can reach. I don't care how awesome your spouse is, I don't care how well your children behave, I don't care how many raises you get on your job. None of that is going to bring the comfort that you need and the comfort that you're seeking. It's too deep. No one else can reach. So sometimes you, you, you're jacking up relationships. Because you're trying to get them to be God because you don't know how to seek the real one. You're, 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 you're putting pressure on people for them to be something that they were not, they were not created to be. You can't put creative responsibilities on a creature. So you have to learn. You have to learn how to seek God. That's all you got to learn how to seek God. And how to receive. How to receive it from him. And so Romans, Romans tells us this. 
Since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done for us. We have peace with God. Like, we're on good terms. Like, you need to know you're on good terms with God. If you're in Christ, you need to know you're on good terms with God. That's the foundation of this relationship where I know I can go to him and find, like, I can go to him and he's not going to be like, you know what, before we get to your little prayer request, let's talk about what happened in 87. He doesn't do that, right? But if you think he, you're going to try to avoid that. I mean, some of you, you are avoiding God because of your own perception of what he's going to say to you. You need to know. So when I go to God, I know I have peace with him. I know that because I am in Christ, my sins have been forgiven. I can go to him for help, and he's going to provide help. Not criticism, not condemnation, not judgment. He's going to provide help. So that's, that's a gospel issue. Do you believe that you have peace with God? Do you believe that because of Christ and your faith in Christ, that you are on good terms with God for all eternity? If you believe that, then you know you can go to him for comfort. If, if that's a little shaky with you, then you still got some questions about God's character. But in Christ, we have peace with God. Last verse, Hebrews 4.16. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will find, we'll receive his mercy and we'll find grace to help us when we need it most. We'll find grace to help us when we need it most. I've mentioned y'all to you before about when my mother died and I found out about like that, that morning, I was just talking to my wife, I'm going to fly down there uh, to South Carolina for Christmas to, to spend Christmas with my mom. An hour later, I get the call that she's gone. And so, I had an emotional reaction. Uh, my wife was out walking the girls uh, um, around the neighborhood, just, and so I texted her, I said, I need, you, I need you home right now. So she came home, and I explained to her what happened, but I was just emotional. I mean, emotional. Some of the details around what, what happened, and she's at home by herself, and that's never the way I wanted. You know, I wanted to be there, you know, by the, by the bedside and be able to say goodbye. And, you know, you imagine. And so all that I felt like was taken. So I had some questions from God. I had some questions for him. I, I, I just said I was going to be there. I just said, God, I was going to be there. Why? But I knew this. I knew, but this, because it happened last December. Hadn't even been a year yet. I knew this, that even though I had questions, I wanted to ask God. Even though I was upset, I was sad, I was grieving, had all this stuff. Even though I knew that, I also knew that what I needed in that moment could not come from my wife, could not come from my kids. And I drove to a park where me and God talk frequently. It's like our, our space. And I and I, I was I was gonna get out and walk around, but it was it was cold. I said I said no, let me let me just sit in this, <laughs> let me get back and sit in this car, and and I just sat there. I sat there, and all I said was, I need you right now. I just need your comfort. I knew I could go to him for that, and he helped me. All of my questions were not answered. I didn't need a rational. I thought I did. You know, sometimes you think, I just need answers. You just need answers. No, you think, you, you think answers give you comfort. That's why you seek, seek them. You're seeking comfort. You don't, you're not seeking answers. You're seeking comfort. And you can have comfort when you don't have answers. That's what's available to you. But it's not just good enough for it to be available. You have to know how to access it. Access it. He is a father who wants to comfort his child and his children. Learn to go to him. And sometimes it's sitting there. You don't, have, you don't feel the whole time with, what should I say? Don't say anything. Just sit there. And in your spirit, you will draw comfort from him by just being there. Moments of silence where you have no words. Don't try to fill it with words. It's you're offering your presence and he offers you his. And that brings comfort. And just like with my daughter, Daddy, can you tuck me in now? The anxiety is now gone. The fear is gone. And now I can appropriately respond. Now I can appropriately show up in the relationships because I have what I needed. 
and I can show up a little differently. It's the hidden power of God's comfort. Let's all stand. When Jesus was going to the cross, he felt like what he needed was the cross to go away. If it's possible, let this cup pass, let this cup pass, let this cup pass. And the Father says, no, no. But he brings Jesus comfort. And Jesus is able to get up, turn to his disciples and say, let us go now. My betrayer is at hand. He's ready to face Calvary because he has received comfort comfort. Don't make other people pay for your lack of comfort. Be careful of how you try to go around seeking validation because you need comfort. There's more I could say, but maybe another time. I think we've said enough. Father, thank you for your spirit. Thank you for the comforter. You promise never to leave us. You are here moving in our midst we worship you and we also receive from you show us how to open our hearts show us how to be aware of what's happening with us what's driving us and show us how faithful you are to be the father that comforts us draws us in draws us near and embraces us to where the fears that have gripped our hearts and the anxieties melt away the confusion the anger the unrest the disappointment the rejection the betrayal the hurt it goes away not because we have all of the answers but because we have all of you and you fill us with your peace and with your comfort. It's in the name of Jesus we pray because it's through him we have access to all of these things. It's in his name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you.